Hi, everybody. Hello and welcome to this outdoor English lesson where you get to ask me some questions and I'll do everything I possibly can to answer them. We'll get started in about 20 seconds. I'm just going to check the audio and make sure everything's working. We'll start in about 10 seconds. You might notice the cicadas are out. I'll explain a little bit more uh, what a cicada is once we get the lesson started. Well, hello and welcome to this live outdoor English lesson. It did crack me up a few weeks ago when someone asked if the background was real. It definitely is real. I'm definitely outside. It is 30 degrees out here right now, but I'm in the shade and it's quite comfortable actually. There's a small breeze and it feels very, very nice. I do want to mention, let's go here, that I do have the river cam set up. We just missed a small boat going by. You can kind of see the wake of the boat in the water still. I'm not sure if you can see that, but I have the river cam set up and I have a chair and a table sitting there. So you can imagine you're sitting there with me watching the river uh, and maybe you can put a little snack on the table or something to drink. Let me go to no display mode. Sorry, let me go to full screen mode so that you can see me. And let me just mention a few things before we get started. First of all, I'm going to do a little audio check and everything sounds good. So I'm not sure if you can hear them, but there are a lot of cicadas in the trees around me. If you hear that sound like wings on an insect going uh, close together, uh, or rubbing together, those, I think that's how they make that sound. They are out in force right now. In English, when you say something is out in force, it means there's a lot of them. So right now, the cicadas will simply add a little ambiance to the background of the English lesson. Hey, if you're new here and you don't know what this is, I'm Bob the Canadian. On Saturdays, three times a month, I let people ask questions and I try to answer them. Questions, of course, about the English language. Uh, before we get started, I do want to say hi to Mode Eggs, Lolly Lolly, Eugene from Etobicoke. We have Brad and Dave moderating this morning. So awesome to have both of them helping out. I want to say hi to Rod from uh, Rod, the Brazilian English teacher, um, who might have a sore shoulder today because I think he got vaccinated yesterday. Uh, Maria C is here. Blue Monster is here. Faith is here. I like to just shout out a few names. Tang Moon is here. Official Tank Bob. He's back. Interesting name. Uh, as well as so many other regulars in the chat. Do remember a couple things. Try to keep the chat in English. It's just helpful and it's good practice. It's a good way to practice your English uh, conversation skills, even if you're just typing. So let's take one more look at the river so that you can get into a peaceful mood before we get started. And let me do one more audio check. Mode Eggs was asking yesterday if I have a bad habit of doing audio checks. And I said, I just like to make sure everything is working properly. Uh, let's get the first question on the screen. There are a few. Uh, let's see here. Tripto has the first question. So here we go. Sometimes we add Y at the end of a word and sometimes we add ish at the end of a word. What is the difference? By the way, childishly has both ish and Y. Um, yeah, that's an interesting because you can say something is like this shirt is bluish. So we add an ish because it's not completely blue. It, it's a little bit blue. This shirt is bluish. If we look at the river cam, you'll see that um, the wind is strong-ish today. You can see the leaves on the tree moving a little bit. Um, so yeah, sometimes we add ish to mean sort of or a little bit. And then I'm not going to go into too much detail about why we add Y. Um, sometimes we're adding L-Y, sometimes we're adding Y. And Tripto, I think that is a bigger lesson uh, than I can explain quickly. Let's go to Eduardo's question. Eduardo, hey Bob, good morning. I have a question. What does it mean to sweep something under the rug? Thanks. So when you sweep something under the rug, it means you hide it. This phrase is used a lot to talk about the government. Sometimes the government does something they're not supposed to and they try to hide it from people. And so they try to sweep it under the rug. They hide all the papers. 
they delete the files. They try to make it so no one can figure out um, what has happened. They sweep it under the rug. By the way, Eduardo, I did go over the pronunciation of house and house in my short English lesson on my other channel today towards the end. If you have that, if you watch that, you will hear the difference. How's it going? I live in a house. Those were the two sentences that I used. Uh, let's see here. M. Bilal says, sir, for upcoming Thursday, what would be right to say? He said he would meet me on Thursday. He said he will meet me on Thursday. They both mean the same thing. They are both completely correct. If someone said to me, um, I will meet you on Thursday or um, I would meet you on Thursday. Oh, just a second here. He said he would meet me on Thursday. That's, that's for sure. He said he will meet me on Thursday. Yes, they mean the same thing in that instance. I almost gave, gave an example where they might mean something different, but I'm going to let that go because I don't want to cause too much confusion. Uh, let's see here. Henry from Taiwan. Hi, teacher Bob. Which one is correct to jar my memory or to jog my memory? Thank you for answering my question. I have heard both phrases, Henry. I have used the second one quite often. I like to jog my memory, okay? But you can also jar your memory. It might be a little less common, but definitely it is a common way to try and remember something as well. Uh, Lashin says, hi, Bob. What's your feeling after learning French? Little correction there. Thank you. I find learning a language to be an awesome experience. I find it's a lot of hard work, but to me, learning a language is like solving a really big puzzle. You know, when you do a puzzle and you put all the pieces together, for me, learning a language is similar to doing a puzzle. It's like, it's a puzzle that's so big, it takes your whole life to actually finish it. So that's what I would say. Um, I love learning languages. I'm going to move on to learning another language. I think when I retire, not sure what language yet, but in the past, I've said it might be Chinese. We'll see. Let's see here. Arena says, hi, Bob. Have you heard ever heard expressions, flashbulb memories and flashing reveries? Are they similar? Would you use them? Thank you. No, I have not heard those phrases and I would not use them. I have to be careful though, because there's a possibility that these are from British English. So I would definitely do a little bit of Google searching to see if those phrases are used um, possibly in British English, because Canadian English is actually a lot more like American English. So we might not use those phrases, but our British cousins might. Uh, Yaroslav has the next question. Morning, teacher Bob. Hope you are doing great. I am. I hope you are as well. My question is, what phrases do the Canadians use to express happiness? I added an S on Canadian there. Uh, we just say, I'm happy. I'm so happy. I'm ecstatic. Uh, I'm overjoyed. Um, I, yeah, those would probably be the best ones. When, um, when Jen and I were having, when Jen had, uh, when our first baby was born, when our son was born, I was overjoyed. I was extremely happy. Those would be good ways to describe happiness. Uh, let's see here. Ellen from Brazil. Hello, teacher Bob. I was reading a book and I saw the sentence, loving people you are stuck with. What does stuck exactly mean in this sentence? So you're stuck with your family. Um, we have a funny phrase in English. You can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. When you are stuck with someone, it means you cannot leave them, okay? So sometimes people feel they're in a relationship and they, maybe they want to leave a little bit, but they feel like they're stuck with their partner. Um, so it just means that you can't leave. And by the way, that phrase again is, you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. That's how life goes. I'm sure some of you have the same phrase in your own languages. Uh, let's see here. Renata. Hi, Renata. Good to see you. Hello from Brazil. Could you please explain the expression so much for thank you in advance. Have a great day. So we have a phrase so much for that. And it's something you say when something goes wrong. Let's say there was someone, um, in the river and they were going to try water skiing. And so the boat started moving and they got up on their skis and the rope broke and they didn't have another rope, they would probably say, well, so much for that. We can't water ski anymore today. So when you say so much for, I'm clicking the wrong buttons. When you say so much for that, 
Um, it means that something has happened and now you can't continue doing what you're doing. Um, if you were, if we were doing this English lesson, um, and the power went out, if the electricity went out, I would probably say, well, so much for that, so much for that lesson. We can't, we can't finish it anymore. Let's see here. Next question from Ruslan. Hi, super teacher, Bob. Hi, Ruslan. I am very fond of your lessons. Thank you. YouTube should remove the thumbs down button under your videos. You simply don't need it. Best wishes, sir. Well, thank you for the kind words, Ruslan. I will admit that I think less than 1% of the people who click the thumbs up and thumbs down, click the thumbs down. Um, and I really don't pay too much attention to that. Uh, but thanks, Ruslan. Next question from Peter. Do you teach IELTS? So I don't. Um, I don't teach IELTS classes. I don't do one-on-one -on -one meetings via Zoom. Uh, I don't teach privately. I don't teach English privately. These are all things that I might do someday. Maybe when I'm semi-retired or retired, I might just take on a few students. That will be in about 10 or more years, by the way. Um, but right now, uh, I do not. I do not offer uh, any classes to prepare for that. Um, if you go to Preply, there's a link in the description below to a website called Preply. You can find an English tutor who specializes in that though. That might be helpful for you. Let's see here. This is Judith coming up with another word. I don't know. Sorry, Judith. Hi, Bob. What does we klept mean? Past participle of klept. I don't know. I wonder again if this is a British word. Um, but Judith, I think Judith, I, Judith, I think you're four for four asking me questions that are hard to answer. And can I can can I hear something about illusion and illusion? So an illusion is something that looks like one thing but isn't. If you're walking in the desert, you, there can be an illusion that you can see an oasis. We call it a mirage. Okay. So an illusion is also what um, magicians do. But an illusion, I want to look up the meaning to make sure I get it right. It's an expression designed to call something to mind without mentioning it. We use the form allude a lot more. Like sometimes we allude to something. That means we're kind of talking about it, but not specifically. Um, tricky questions, but I like it. Next question from Maria. Do the words, little fix there, do the words tailor customize and adjust mean the same. Example of using tailor, tailoring products to meet customer needs. So yes, you know, I tailor my lessons to people who are learning English. I customize my lessons for people. I adjust my lessons. They all have slight differences, but they all mean to change something usually for the better. So yes, when you design something, you could also use the word tailor. When you customize something, you could also use the word adjust. So yeah, I would, I would say tailor and customize and adjust are slightly different. Customize and adjust are very similar. Uh, let's see here. Next question from Daniel. Hey, it's me again, Bob. Hi, Daniel. Do they teach Spanish in Canada in public schools? It depends on the size of the school. In larger high schools in, uh, in Canada, there are more courses offered. In most high schools, you can learn French. In larger high schools, you might be able to learn Spanish or German or Chinese um, or something like that. But generally, um, schools are fairly small and you can only learn uh, French as your second language. Mirage, please describe prone and instincts. So when you're prone to doing something, it means that you do it a lot, okay? I'm prone to drinking a lot of water during a live stream because my throat gets a little bit dry. Um, my one kid is prone to play with cats every day. That means they like playing with cats. Instincts are things that come naturally to you. I have a really good instinct when someone is confused in my class, okay? So I can kind of tell by if they're fidgeting a bit, if they're looking around, uh, maybe they're trying to look at other students' work. Maybe they're whispering. So I have an instinct. It means I can kind of tell um, if someone is needing some help. So 
Um, and there's different instincts as well, right? Like Jen has really good instincts when it comes to taking care of animals. I'm, I'm not as good at that, but Jen can sense when animals are hungry and all those kinds of things. Betty Lou. Hello, teacher Bob. Would you mind sharing some tips for English reading? Thanks for the answer. Have a nice day. Sure. So one thing I would say is this, first of all, if there's books you have read in your own language, try reading the same book again in English. So let's say when you were a teenager, you read a certain book in your own language. Try to find that book now in English and read it again. Number two, if you are struggling with reading, make sure you're at the right level. So if you're reading fiction and it's very difficult, try reading young adult fiction, which is a little easier to understand. I'll just give those two tips for now. There are many tips that I could give, but those would be the two I would recommend. Let's see here. Roy says, hello, Mr. Bob. I just want to thank you for your great videos. It helps me a lot. No problem, Roy. Thank you so much. Um, you are very, very welcome. Uh, let's see here. Margo. Hi, teacher Bob. Please help to understand these phrases. Little fix there. To win spurs and to perk up. Thanks a lot. So to win spurs is not a phrase I'm familiar with. It might be Australian or British. So I, I have never seen that phrase before. But to perk up means I taught the phrase to come alive the other day and to perk up is very similar. Um, if you're sitting and you're listening to people talk and you're not really paying attention and then they mention something you like, like hockey or the Olympics, you might perk up. So you, you literally become more alert and you become interested in the conversation. So when you perk up, you come alive, you become interested in what's happening around you. Andre, hello, Mr. Bob. Is it correct to use the word two, two times like this? We recommend to you to contact technical support. How would you say that? I would say we recommend you contact technical support without either of the twos, okay? What you have written is totally correct. We recommend to you to contact technical support, but the, the quick informal way of saying it would be, we recommend that you can, that you contact technical support or we recommend you contact technical support. They're informal. So the last one is probably somewhat incorrect, but that is what you would say. And then I do think the most common phrase would be, we, we recommend that you contact technical support. Um, you want the fast version? We recommend you contact tech support. Yes, that would be it. We recommend you contact tech support. We shorten technical a lot when we talk about tech, tech support. Um, next question is from YJ. I haven't looked at the chat for a bit, but hi to everybody in the chat over there. I hope you're having fun. I see some people uh, asking questions. You do know I only ask answer questions from the form. So please do ask them there. But YJ says, hello, Mr. Bob, how should I practice English intonation? It's the most difficult part of the English of English studying for me. So this is a tricky one because it involves using the correct muscles and to form the correct sounds, right? And it involves making sure that your voice goes up and down as you're saying certain things. So one of the best examples of intonation would be um, asking a question, like saying, um, how much is this? Or you can see, how much is this? I'm not the best person to answer questions about intonation. It does come naturally for me. So I would say this, listen to native English speakers and then shadow what they are saying. That would be the best way, I think, to practice that for sure. Next question from Amaro. Hi, teacher Bob. My question is, what's the difference between I did tell you that yesterday and I told you that yesterday? Thanks an awful lot. The Both are correct. So good job there. The first one has more emphasis. The first one sounds more like it would be part of an argument. Like um, if I said to someone, I did tell you that yesterday. That's probably how we would say it. Like, you should have told me this yesterday. I did tell you that yesterday. I did tell you that yesterday. You can hear how my voice, I'm raising my voice a bit. If you say, I told you that yesterday, it could be part of an argument, but it could also just be part of a conversation. Um, so they're both correct. 
Um, but the first one sounds a little more emphatic. Um, Mode is saying, you sounded like an authentic tech support there. <laughs> yeah. I used to do tech support. So I used to say, did you, have you rebooted your computer? Did you turn it off and on? The classic joke. Eugene, this is a great question, Eugene. Good morning, Mr. Bob. Do you have any superstitions? I'm going to put an S on the end. Superstitions. I don't really. But one thing that's kind of funny for me is sometimes when I turn the volume up on the TV, I want it to be volume 15 or 20 or 25, not 17 or 18. I like it when it's in groups of five. And sometimes when I'm really, really tired, when I walk, I count my steps for some reason in my mind. It's a silly thing. It's not a superstition, but I'm always trying to go upstairs in groups of 10. It's kind of a weird thing I do. This is this lesson today is where Bob shares weird uh, personality traits about himself. Uh, let's see here. Mahmood says, how can we, we got to flip that. How can we chat live with you? Do you have a paid channel like other teachers? Thanks. So I, again, I don't actually do this, Mahmood. Um, I know some teachers offer courses and private classes uh, and all those kinds of things. I have a job. I'm already a high school teacher. And so I have uh, plenty of work on that front. And I do YouTube as kind of my second job. Um, I like making lessons. I like that um, some people do pay to become members, but we don't have one-on-one -on -one conversations. That's just a way to thank me if you want. Um, but someday, someday in the future, I might do that. No promises though. Next question from Natalia. Have you got any conversation courses? No, sorry. I know people would really like that. They've even suggested just start a group on Facebook or somewhere else, but I don't really have time to moderate that. I don't think it's worthwhile unless um, someone has time to make sure things go well. Next question from Harney. Which, oh, should we look at the river? Let's go to the river cam while I have a little sip of water. You can pretend you're in the chair again. If you're wondering what those blocks are in front of the chair, that is our fire pit. So every once in a while, we'll have a fire there. And then we will grill things on top of it. So Renata says, you're not the only one, Bob. I can only get off the treadmill on an even number. L laughing out loud. Hope that's not OCD. Yeah, I think everyone has unique characteristics, right, Renata? Thanks for sharing that, though. It makes me feel a little more normal. Uh, Harney, which is the best way to learn English? I don't have native English speakers in my country. So what I've recommended in the past is this. You can do a lot of listening practice on your own. You can do reading on your own. You can do some writing on your own, but speaking is where it's very important that you find a speaking partner. If you can't find someone in your country, you might need to find someone online. You can either do a language exchange where you teach them your language and they teach you English, or you might need to hire someone with a website like Preply. There's a link below if you want to check into that. Um, it can be very, very reasonable. Mode says, hi, wise, gray-haired Mr. Bob. <laughs> what valuable lessons have you learned from doing YouTube? Thank you for being back with these awesome outdoor lessons. Well, there's actually a lesson I learned from selling flowers that I realized is the same with YouTube. And that's this. We go to a market every week. We never skip a week. Okay. We always go every week. We go and sell flowers at the market. And I feel like YouTube is the same thing. I know I take one Saturday a month off, but I think consistently putting lessons out every Tuesday and for sure doing a live stream on Friday mornings is a valuable lesson. Consistency can be rewarding. I think a lot of my growth on YouTube, the fact that I have a lot of subscribers is because I'm very consistent. I think that's helpful. Um, people can count on me, or at least I hope they think they can count on me. Um, let's see here. Ario says, Ola, Mr. Robert, how are you? I was watching Mr. Brent's live stream today. He said, hide someone and keep someone. It's different. What do you think? Thank you. To hide someone and keep someone. Yeah, I'm not sure how I would describe either of those, Ario. Um, when you hide someone, 
Like I know during certain times, like when there's a war, you might hide someone in your house. Um, if you keep someone though, that's a little more nefarious. That's a little more bad sounding. I'm not sure exactly, but they're definitely different meanings. And by the way, for those of you who are wondering, um, Ario is talking about Brent. Brent is American English with this guy. That's his YouTube channel. He also does live streams and English lessons. It's a very cool guy. Let's see here. Lolly, lolly, bonjour, Bob. Est-ce qu'il y a une différence entre le sens de? I think I said that right. I don't know. I sometimes try to read Lolly's questions in French. Count on me and count me in. Merci, Bob. Between count on me and oh, so count on me and count me in. If I say count on me, it means you can rely on me. It means I'm reliable. And this kind of relates to what I just said. You can count on me to have a new English lesson every Tuesday. You can count on me to do a live lesson every Friday. You can count on me. I do it all the time. I rarely ever miss. I don't think I ever miss. Sometimes I'm a bit late. Count me in means I want to do it too. If two of my friends said, uh, we're going to a movie. Um, we're going to see the new, um, what movie's out right now? I can't think of one. Suicide Squad, is that out? I might say, oh, count me in. That means I would like to come as well. Let's see here. Next question from Natalia. Hello, can we say to need a plan, like to conceive it? No, we probably wouldn't do that. Or is it to do an idea? Nope, we probably wouldn't say that either. We would conceive a plan. You know, he might conceive a plan. That means he thinks of a plan. Um, or he yeah, had an idea. So no, we wouldn't need it. Kneading is when you work dough. I think you knew that, Natalia, but just for the other people, when you make bread, you knead the dough. Jenny, hi, Bob. I really love your channel. Thanks, Jenny. What does intimidating mean? Well, I'll give you my best intimidating look. Okay, when someone is intimidating, it means you're a little bit scared of them. They seem um, a little bit aggressive. So here's my intimidating look. I'm really not sure what that looks like. Let's make it bigger. This is Bob the Canadian trying to look intimidating. I don't know. Maybe I just look silly. Let me check. Let me see what that actually looks like. I'm watching myself on the screen. It's a little delayed. Yeah, that was intimidating. That was a pretty good intimidating look. So intimidating. When you go to a concert, they sometimes have people called bouncers who work at the front door and they're usually really large and muscular and very intimidating. That means you're, you're a little bit um, worried about them. You're a little bit scared of them. I'm not intimidating. I just look a little intimidating sometimes. Let's see here. Bruno says, hello, Bob. Do you have any tips regarding prepositions? No, but I do have one video where I taught the prepositions on, at, by, and in. Maybe Dave can find it and put a link in the description or in the chat. Um, but I never know how to use them. For instance, I was walking in the street, on the street. What prepositions should I use? Thanks. So I think this is bigger than, um, this is a bigger question than I can answer during a live lesson, but it comes from doing a lot of listening practice and you should watch some YouTube videos where they explain the difference between the two or between the different prepositions. I'll do another lesson on it someday, Bruno. Let's see here. Arian says, hello, Mr. Bob, hope you are well. I'm from Bangladesh. My question is, what's the difference between only and just? Have a good day. So the problem with only and just is that we use them all the time, okay? Um, I'll only be a few minutes. I'll just be a few minutes. Like, hey, I'm ready to leave. Yep, I'll just be a few minutes. I'll only be a few minutes. Or there were only a few people there or there were just a few people there. The word isn't actually that important. There were a few people there. We don't have to put only or just in, but it's kind of a little bit of, um, a little bit of extra spice in the sentence, I think. So, but there's more to that answer and that I can answer quickly. So I'm going to let that go. Um, I do want to say hi to the 464 people who are watching. Hi, everybody. Let's go to no display. If you're wondering what's happening, 
I'm Bob the Canadian. I teach English here on YouTube. I almost said French. <laughs> I teach English here on YouTube. If you're new here, please click that red subscribe button and you'll get notified whenever I do a new lesson. Um, I do one recorded lesson every Tuesday, usually a short six to 10 minute lesson where I explain an English concept. I do a longer live lesson every Friday. Uh, in fact, yesterday we did bad habits. It was a fun lesson. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and I do this live stream three times a month on Saturdays. Um, so uh, yeah, if you like learning English and you find me to be a pleasant person to learn from, uh, please watch more. Um, let me see here. I'm going to give go to Riverview because I'm going to set. Um, we're going to go to viewer, sorry, members only chat for a little bit here. So let me get that set up. Make sure that's all working. Oh, there's a cat. Everyone gets to watch a cat run by in the background. I'm not sure which cat it is. I have a child who takes care of cats for me, but this cat is not causing a problem. Um, one of my kids makes sure the cats don't jump on the table because one, one time I was doing a live stream and the cats were like pulling on the cables for the camera. That's not a good thing. Anyways, we're going to uh, members only chat. I'm going to leave full display up while I do that. Um, let me get my glasses so I can see. Um, here we go. Mode says the cat's going by. Yes. And then Mirage says in a lesson, you said bling can be referred to a fancy car or something. But in the comment, you said you would say bling to describe only jewelry. Why two types of statement? I, I have to find the point where I said that Mirage because we wouldn't use bling to talk about a car. I think I must have made a mistake when I taught that. So um, leave a comment here with the link to the video where I talked about that. And I'll, I'll try to see what I said. And then Mode says hi to the cat patrol kid. Yes. Hey, let me get questions on the screen as well while we're doing this. Mode Ag says, I think the cats are coming after your dead cat. Yeah. So this if you're wondering what mode is talking about, this is called a dead cat. Kind of a funny name, isn't it? The wind protector on a microphone is called a dead cat. I always find that name to be funny. Uh, Mirage says the jewelry and accessories lesson. I'll have a look at that, Mirage. I'll see. But I'll say this. I'll stand. I'll correct myself. Jewelry is bling. A car would not be bling. Uh, let's see here. Let me find a question here. Annie from Vietnam says, hi, Bob, greeting from Vietnam. I love your lesson. I think when I put my glasses on, did it become really dark? Look at that. Now it lightens up and you can see me. Okay, I'll leave my glasses off. Wasn't that weird? I put my glasses on and then the camera went a lot to dimmer. I can read without them. Linda, hello, guys. I'm late. Just want to say hi to everyone. And hi, Bob. Hi, Linda. Good to see you. Maria says, hi, Bob. How are you? I'm reading from the uh, members chat right now. Everyone wants to talk to you. Hee <laughs> hee. Requests will continue for sure. And you'll become more and more famous on YouTube. Sure. Uh, we'll see. On the, whenever people ask if I'm famous, I always say I'm not famous in Canada. I don't think I'm famous anywhere. Um, but uh, I'm certainly not famous in my own country. Most people don't know that I do this. Uh, Maria C. I have a question too. Can you add the suffix ish to any adjective? So it was smallish, it was biggish, it was scary ish. You can, it doesn't always work though. Um, it certainly works for colors like bluish, greenish. It had a greenish tinge, so it was a little bit green. Um, we wouldn't say hot ish, but we would say cold ish. Yeah, so it's tricky. I think you have to listen and learn which ones we actually do use. Uh, Tan H gives me a little heart. Thanks, Tan H. Betty Lou, hi, the most cutest teacher, Bob. Thanks, Betty. I'm kind of interested in your French learning journey. Would you mind sharing it a little bit? Thanks for your hard work. I always appreciate it. Superb. So I'll talk about it a little bit right now. Let me just do something for a sec. My camera did something weird. I can't quite reach it. There we go. The viewfinder had turned off. Um, first of all, my French learning journey started uh, in kindergarten. So in Canada, st uh, students in school learn a little bit of French from grade 
one from kindergarten grade one all the way to grade nine. So from age six, five or six up to age 13, you have to take French class. It's usually 20 minutes once or twice a week. It's not anything huge. Um, and then from there, uh, I continued taking it. I took it in high school. I took it in college. I lived in Quebec uh, a long time ago for almost nine or 10 months. Um, and then I practice a lot online. I actually talk to a friend of mine in France once a week. I talk French for 30 minutes uh, or we talk French and then we talk English for 30 minutes. It's a great exchange and a lot of fun. Uh, let me get another question on the screen and do another question from the chat. Modag says to Maria C, I think ish communicates a sense of approximation. Yes, yes, for sure. It's not exact. Eugene from Etobicoke says, hi, Bob. Superstitions such as Chinese didn't like the number four. Somebody didn't like the black cat. Not under the ladder. Somebody didn't like the number 13. Yes. I think I did a lesson on superstitions. That might have been last summer, right? Don't walk under a ladder. Uh, don't open an umbrella inside. There's all these little superstitions. Uh, let's jump over here. Yasin says, are flashcards useful to boost vocabulary? I think so. You know, what's really fun is using flashcards with another person where you test each other. That's a fun thing to do. My students do that sometimes in my classes. Uh, let's see here. Mirage in the chat says, Mr. Bob, if I say this is out of my instinct, what does it mean? When you do something out of instinct, it's like you know how to do it without having learned how to do it. Um, let me see what would be a good example. Jen's really good at planting seeds and watering them and making them grow. You can't really learn from a book how to do that well. She just has good instincts. She does it out of instinct. Okay. So it's like you kind of know something without having studied it. Maria C, another question, Bob. Are your students from French classes, English native speakers, or are they from different countries too? Both, actually. In fact, um, most of them are uh, from Canada, but some are from other countries. And some actually uh, speak French really well. So they take the French classes because they want to get the credit. So when they go to university, it says that they learned French. Um, but sometimes students come from countries where they've already learned French. It's very cool. Um, let me get the next question on the screen. Ananya Roy. Hi, Bob. What kinds of questions do you prefer? The easiest questions for me to answer are always pronunciation and usage questions. So if someone says to me, how do I pronounce the word robot? Or how do you use the word robotic? And then it's very easy for me to say, oh, robot is pronounced robot. A robot is a mechanical thing that seems like a person. And when it moves, um, it has robotic movements. So those are the kinds of questions I prefer. I don't mind grammar questions, but sometimes I can't answer the question in less than a minute. I try to answer one question every 30 seconds to a minute. I like to keep things moving. I think it's more enjoyable. Um, so those questions are easy to answer quickly. Let's see here. Monsieur Bob est le meilleur. Merci beaucoup, Maud Eggs. Il parle français aussi. Très bien. Maria C, you're right, Maud. And then Maud Eggs. Or maybe they just want to learn French from a famous person. No, I, I've been doing this a long time. I, I'm pretty sure that students don't take my classes because uh, they think I'm famous. I think they just think me, they just think of me as another one of the teachers. Um, Raheem says, dear teacher Bob, why and how do you check the audio of your live stream? So why do I check it? Because sometimes it seems like the audio is the thing that's most likely to go wrong. So I like to check it. And I think because I said yesterday, we had a lesson yesterday about bad habits. And I said that um, being a perfectionist, wanting everything to be perfect is a bad habit. And I claimed I wasn't a perfectionist, but I think I'm, I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. So uh, let's see here. Or maybe just want to learn. Oh, Zhu Shen, welcome. Oh, thank you so much for becoming a member. Awesome. Mode Egg says, no, I think, no, I think I speak French like a Canadian in grade nine. Possibly. Peut-être. On ne sait pas. Uh, tu as commencé à apprendre le français quand? When did you start learning French? I probably made a mistake in that sentence. It came out too quickly. 
Uh, let me get another question on the screen, though. This is from Van, and Van says, do you have any advice for beginners when learning English? Thanks. So, the best advice I would give for an absolute beginner is you want to learn a, a base amount of vocabulary, and you almost have to brute force learn it. When you brute force something, it means you just do it till you know it. So, find the 500 most common English words or a thousand and just memorize them. The beginning of any language learning journey is to learn. You just have to memorize enough vocabulary to start to recognize things. So, that's what I would say. Um, not sure. I'm going to skip the next one. It's a little strange. This is from Mikhailo. What can you recommend reading in English for level A1? And what can you recommend if the enthusiasm for learning the language has disappeared? Well, that's a, that's a big question. I would say this. A1, you should be reading kids books. You should be reading comics. You should be reading the news. The news is actually fairly easy to understand usually. So, I would start with those three things uh, for sure. And then enthusiasm, that's a tricky one. Um, maybe create rewards for yourself. Like if you study English five times a week, you get to have ice cream on Saturday night or do something a little more uh, forceful like book, like register for an English test in three months so that you force yourself to study. Uh, Maria says, Bob, do you speak some Dutch? You said that your parents or grandparents, I don't remember, are from the Netherlands. I don't. I have a few words like uh, eight smaklik. I think we say that before we eat, but I don't know very much Dutch at all. It's sad. Uh, J'ai commencé à apprendre le français il y a cinq ou six mois. Oh, so that's not too bad, Mode, if you're already writing sentences. Good job. Let's see here. Next question is from Michael. Hey, teacher Bob, you're making, you're making an awesome, you're doing an awesome job. Little fix there. It helps me a lot. You're doing something that many teachers don't. So, thank you so much again. Well, it's no problem. I really do enjoy doing this. Sorry, I'm doing two things at once here. I'm switching the chat back so that everyone can chat again. Michael, um, it's no problem. Um, my love of languages, my love of technology, and my experience as a teacher all combine together to make this kind of a fun I know I mentioned earlier that YouTube's a little bit like my job now because it is a bit, but it's really kind of a hobby. I just really like doing it. So, it's no problem. You're very, very welcome. Uh, let's see here. Next question from Nazir from India. Hi, Mr. Bob. How have you been? Good. How have you been, Nazir? My question, how, what, got to switch that. What is the correct pronunciation of target? I heard people pronounce this, pronouncing this word two different ways, thanks in advance. So, we say target. There was a store actually called target, but a target is actually like if I had a bow and arrow, I would shoot the arrow at the target. Okay. Target. I'm trying to think if there's another way to pronounce target. If you're watching the Olympics, there's archery in the Olympics and they try to hit the target. Um, by the way, that might be a hobby I might start someday. Archery. That always looks fun. The Olympics always makes me think of um, hobbies I maybe should try. I'm not going to become a synchronized swimmer though. That's not one of them. Um, Sergio says, hi there, Bob. Hi, Sergio. Any chance to go to Canada as a teacher of English? If you're asking if you could come to Canada and be an English teacher, the answer is yes. Canada is a bilingual country. There are many people in our French-speaking provinces um, who would love to learn English. So, if you have an excellent grasp of the English language, um, you could you could definitely be an English teacher in Canada. Although, it's probably easier to move here as a French teacher. Roger says, hello, Bob. What are the procedures you have to go through to become an English teacher to be able to practice as much as a teacher? So, the procedures I went through to become a teacher, I'm a language teacher. I teach English on YouTube, but I teach French at my local high school. I uh, went to university and I got a French degree and I got a degree in teaching a second language, okay? So, uh, teaching French as a second language. 
I also lived in the province of Quebec for about nine or 10 months to perfect my French speaking skill. And as well, I continually read in French, watch the news in French and talk to a friend of mine in French each week. Um, so I'm not sure if the process would be the same to become an English teacher. I know to teach English, you can get a certificate in one year or two years online. I went the old fashioned route and got a, a degree from university. So let's see here. Tattoo says, hello, Bob. Thank you for the lessons. Could you please explain the meaning of the word preempting? Thank you in advance. When you preempt something, it means you prevent it from happening. You act in a way that you prevent something. So let's say a cat was going to jump on me. And just before the cat jumped, my, uh, my daughter grabbed it. She would have preempted the cat's attack. Okay. So she did something to stop it before it happened. Great question, by the way. Manura. Here's Manura's question. Hi, Bob. I am your new follower. Can you tell if the pronunciation sheet and shit are, are the same? Also, how to correct, pronounce correctly three and tree. So sheet, when you go to bed, you have a sheet and a blanket. Sheet. So you can hear the E sound. Sheet. Your second word is considered somewhat of a bad word, but it's much shorter in sounding like shit. Okay. Um, also to pronounce three. So I have three fingers up, but I'm sitting under a tree. Um, let me use a sentence with all three. There are three trees over there. Yes. I sat in tree number three. There you go. There's a good one. Uh, let's see here. Next question is from Allie. Hello, Bob. It's hard for me to read and speak English. How can I improve it? My texting, my text messaging, little fix there, is way better. I am from Kuwait. There are no people to speak English with. So number one, you say there's no people to speak English with, but there is the internet. So I think the number one thing you need to do is find an English tutor online, someone who you can talk to via Zoom or Skype or FaceTime or any of those uh, products. There are places like Cambly or italki or Preply where you can find someone. You do have to pay them, um, but that is the best way to improve your English speaking is to find a tutor um, for sure. Um, reading, you can improve simply by reading a lot. Okay. So make sure that you're reading the news in your own language, read a book in your own language. When you watch videos where there's a transcript, read the transcript before you watch the video. There's many opportunities to read. When you look something up, use the English version of Wikipedia always. Let's see. Giovanni, Giovanni from Brazil. Morning, Mr. Bob. Hi, Giovanni. I've seen the phrasal verb get carried away recently and I got a bit confused. If someone gets carried away, it means someone got excited a bit too much. Yes. Uh, when people get carried away, they get really excited or they overdo something. Um, Let's say that you needed flowers for a party and your wife said, go and buy 10 bouquets of, uh, from Jen. And if you came here and you bought 50 bouquets because they looked so beautiful, we would say you got carried away. So you overdid something because of your excitement. Um, it happens a lot. Actually, people get carried away a lot, which means they get really excited or they overdo something. Next question from Arshad. I'm from Pakistan. My mother language is Sindhi. My question is that if we don't know much vocabulary, how can we follow you, sir? So this is tricky. My lessons, of course, are all in English. I do speak relatively clearly and slowly, but I use fairly advanced vocabulary. So I would say this. Um, maybe watch some of my earlier lessons, some of my shorter lessons. I did actually speak slower when I started my channel. Um, and then maybe watch one every day until you get caught up. It'll go, it's going to take you a while, by the way, there's a lot of lessons on there, but certainly try to watch them at a slower speed. You can actually change the speed of the YouTube player. And if you slow that down, it might help you a lot. And then 
just try to learn some new vocabulary words from each video until they start to make sense. Uh, let's see here. Andrew says, thanks a bunch, Bob, for your videos. You rock. Just a little question. Do you have any prejudice or something? No, I, I am not a prejudicial person. I believe that anyone who walks into my classroom or anyone who watches my YouTube videos can be successful in life. It does not matter to me where you are from in the world. It does not matter when a student walks into my classroom in person at school. I do everything I can to help them. I believe every student can succeed. Anyone who watches my videos, I believe can succeed. It doesn't matter to me how old you are. It doesn't matter if you're a guy or a girl. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. Everyone I think can succeed in the world. We are a world of smart, intelligent people. And so I hold no prejudice against anyone uh, when it comes to learning or in any other uh, capacity. Uh, I just don't have it in me. Um, maybe when I was younger, I maybe had attitudes like people from the other town, you know, maybe my town was better than your town or something, but no, not anymore. I'm too old for that. Um, I'm just trying to make the world a better place. So Tiru says, hi, Mr. Bob, how can I change my English accent like a native English speaker? Thanks in advance. Well, number one, if you're older, you can, okay? You can learn to pronounce things very clearly. You can learn to minimize your uh, accent that's coming through. Um, when I speak French, I have an accent and it's just the way it is. When I speak French, I strive to speak clearly. I try to practice pronouncing things properly, but I still make mistakes and I still sound like an English speaker when I speak French. So I would say, don't worry about it. Don't set your goal to become um, as good at speaking English as a native speaker. Set your goal to be better each day compared to the day before. So compare yourself to yourself. Like say, okay, today, I'm a better English speaker than I was yesterday and just work from there. Hey, I do want to say hi to the, I'll go to river cam for a bit. Isn't it beautiful out there? It's a nice day. Um, but I am getting a little warm. I do want to say hi to the 559 people who are watching. I'll do my bad habit. Um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, this is a live English lesson where I try to answer English questions or questions about the English language. If you're new here, don't forget to click the red subscribe button and give me a thumbs up if this video helps you learn just a little bit of English. I've said that a lot, haven't I? Oh, I don't have an Oscar cam, but Oscar is barking. Oh, now he's running out. Oh, I should have an Oscar cam as well, shouldn't I? Uh, let's get to the next question. So Tao says, hello, Mr. Bob. Could you please recommend where I can find an English native speaker to talk with? Thank you. So first of all, you don't have to find a native English speaker. You just need to find an English teacher. And I'll tell you this, native English teachers aren't necessarily any better than non-native English teachers. Um, the one area they might be better in is in perfecting your pronunciation, possibly. But I would say this, you might be better off with a non-native English teacher when you're first learning the language. I think you might be better off because they know all of the little tricks. They know, they've experienced what you're trying to do. They know what it's like to learn English and they might have a whole bunch of little uh, helpful tips for you. So where can you find one? Go to Preply. There's a link in the description below. Um, you do have to pay money. Um, go to Cambly, go to italki. There's a few other ones. I don't know all the names. Um, but certainly I recommend Preply. I used Preply uh, when I was practicing my French. It was really easy to find someone to speak with. And it was very reasonable. Like the, it wasn't too expensive. Um, so that's what I would do. <laughs> someone in the chat is asking if I could do a Russian accent. No, I can't. I don't think I would do a good job. Although I, I could try some point. Maybe I'll, no, I don't know. We'll see. I'm not doing one right now for sure. Uh, let's see here. Kokan says, good evening, teacher Bob. I am from Bangladesh. It's 9.25 p.m. here. Could you please explain all possible meanings of the, of the word tender? Well, 
I don't know if this is private medical information, but Rod, the Brazilian English teacher, got his vaccination yesterday. So his shoulder is probably tender. When something's tender, it it hurts a little bit, okay? Um, the other day I lifted weights and now my muscles are a little bit tender. It means they hurt just a little bit. When a large company is looking to build something, they will have people put in tenders. A tender is when you say, I will build your building for this much money. Um, when someone is really tender, it can mean that they're really nice. They're really calm to be around. Um, I think that's all of them. I think I should look one of those up for a sec. Let's do meaning of tender and see how many come up here to show gentleness. Um, oh, if food is easy to eat, we would say it's tender. Um, sensitive to pain. Yes. Um, there we go. That's all I can think of right now. I think that should be adequate. Uh, next question from Dima from Russia. Uh, Dima says, Hey, Uncle Bob, how are you doing? Which one is correct? I don't really know. I really don't know. They're both correct. We say both of them. Okay. I don't really know. I really don't know. Um, I don't even think, I think they're totally interchangeable. Yeah. I don't really know. I really don't know. I, I'm, I'm just saying them. I'm not saying I don't know. I do know. <laughs> um, but yes, you could say, I really don't know. I don't really know. I don't know, really. You say that too, by the way. Sometimes we put words everywhere in sentences. It must be really, really difficult for some of you. Let's see. Let's see if I can interpret this. Hi, Bob. What is the difference in meaning? I have used to. I am used to. Oh, when you used to do something, it means you did it in the past and you don't do it anymore. Okay. So yesterday we had a lesson on bad habits. You can still watch it if you want. Um, and I said, I used to smoke. Okay. So when you say, um, I used to smoke, it means it's something you did in the past that you don't do anymore. Okay. We don't use I and G with that. Okay. The second one though, when you said I am used to smoking or I am used to running or I am used to eating less, that simply means that it's normal for you now. When I first started walking every day, it was hard, but now I'm used to walking. That means it's normal and easy for me to do now. There you go. Uh, let's see here. Why you says, hello, Mr. Bob. I want to ask about how to understand fast native speakers. So a little fix there. Oh, let me just, let me check this out. How to understand what native speakers say when English is not our first language. There we go. How to understand what fast native English speakers say when English is not our first language. Sorry, I've messed your question up twice now, but I understand. Um, I think it's okay to say, hey, could you speak a little more slowly? Um, when I'm having a conversation with someone in French, sometimes I'll just say, um, c'est difficile pour moi à comprendre, est-ce que tu peux parler un peu plus lentement? So I'll just say, hey, it's hard for me to understand, can you speak a little more slowly? Um, and it's fine to say that. I have students who are learning English who will say, um, hey, can you speak a little more slowly? I'm having trouble understanding. Totally fine to say that. Uh, Alina. Hello, teacher. Could you explain how to use legit in a sentence? Thank you. So legit is a short, kind of a slang word for legitimate, which means authentic or real. Um, but we use it to say things like, um, uh, yeah, you did a legit job the other day. Um, I'm trying to think. You could even say, oh, that video last Tuesday was legit. Basically, it's a positive compliment. You're saying that something was really, really cool and really, really awesome. Like that car is legit. I think it's an older word. I'm not sure it's used very much anymore. I'll have to check on Google Trends at some point. Um, by the way, Google Trends is a great place. You'll see a graph of how often a word has been used in search. So you can kind of figure out whether something is still uh, popular. Maria, next question. Hi, Bob. Do you recommend Discord to practice English? The last time I heard two people in a channel to practice English arguing for some unknown reason. I've always been in favor of use everything you possibly can to practice the language you are learning. So play video games and use voice chat. Um, join a Discord server, not just to learn English, but join a Discord server where people uh, of who have the same interests as you are all gathering. 
Um, certainly, the more you can do, the better it is. So, read, write, listen, speak. Anytime you can do those things in another uh, area, like in a Discord server, do it for sure. Um, whether people argue and fight in Discord servers, humans, yeah, people don't get along sometimes. So, it's bound to happen once in a while. Next question. Paulo, hey teacher, I'm Brazilian. Are the pronunciation of the words steel and steel different? Yes. So that building is made out of steel and that person was able to steal four cars in one night. Same pronunciation, different meanings. Let's see here. Next question from Athanasios. Hi, Athanasios. Hello, Teacher Bob. We say a store is opposite of the castle or opposite the castle. Thank you. Both are correct. We would use the second one though. Okay. So we would say like, um, oh, the um, the gas station is opposite the grocery store. I don't know if we would say opposite of the or opposite from the. We might say both. The gas station is opposite the grocery store. That's the most common. The gas station is opposite from the grocery store. We would say that. The gas station is opposite of the... No, I don't think we would say that one. We would definitely say the first one. The store is opposite the castle. It's, it sounds kind of informal and slangy though, but that's how we would say it. Um, Antonio. Hello, Bob. How do you control weeds in your flower beds with these? We pull them. So we hoe. Um, we have actually something called a wheel hoe. I'll show it someday. I'm going to do a lesson about the farm and show you different farm tools. Um, but we hoe and uh, we pull weeds by hand. Uh, we also use fabric. A lot of our plants, we put down what's called landscape fabric and there's small holes and we plant a flower in each hole. So a variety of things. Uh, we don't spray. Um, that's one of the things we don't do. Uh, we're going to end on this question, everybody, from Batista. I'm from Brazil. I just want to thank you for all your work here on YouTube. On YouTube. It helps me a lot. <clears throat> it's cracking me up. No, sorry. It's my throat. Uh, God bless you and your family. Well, thanks, Batista. Um, that's very nice of you. I don't know what's wrong with my throat, people. Things have been going well. And then I think maybe I have allergies again. That's always possible in this time of year. Let's go to River Cam just for a minute while I thank Brad and Dave for moderating the chat. If you're wondering if this is ending, yes, it's slowly ending. Uh, it has been one hour. Let me go to full screen mode just to say bye to all of you. Thank you for joining me here again on a Saturday. I will be live again next Saturday, um, but I normally do three in a row. I know I just took two weeks off, but I will be I was just going to say, I will be here today. Obviously, I'm here today. I will be doing another live lesson next Saturday for sure. But the Saturday after that, I'm not available. Um, so the schedule might be a little bit uh, up and down over the next few weeks. So just pay attention to what I schedule. I will for sure be putting a lesson out on this channel on Tuesday. Uh, and I will for sure be doing a live stream next Friday. In fact, those are the two things I rarely skip. Uh, you can count on me. Um, to do those things. You can re rely on that happening. Anyways, thank you Valerio for the super chat and says, can I say my brother towers over me? Yes, definitely. If your brother is taller than you, you would say my brother towers over me. Um, my younger brother towers over me. My older brother and I are about the same height. So anyways, bye to everyone. Thanks again, Dave and Todd. Thanks to Rod uh, Dave and Todd. Todd wasn't here. Dave and Brad. <laughs> Sorry, Brad, uh, for hanging out. Uh, thanks to Maria C., Eugene, Wando, uh, Wanda. Sorry. Um, let me scroll back. Semra, Lolly, Lolly, Mode Eggs, Eduardo, Judith is here. Uh, I know that Semra was here, but I think had to leave. Uh, Patty Candle is here. Brahim. I'm just scrolling back through. 989840. Always fun to chat with you beforehand. Um, Rod, the Brazilian English teacher. Uh, Roni is here. Without my glasses, it's hard to see. Anyways, thank you so much for hanging out with me on this beautiful summer day. I think we have a few months left of outdoor live streams. I'm going to try and go as late in the fall as possible sitting outside. Um, I like cold weather, so that shouldn't be a problem. But anyways, bye everybody. Uh, I'll leave you with river cam view and I'll just uh, 
shut things down in just a sec.